in the squadron. They called him Bullets, but we call him Greg Kelly. Greg Kelly is on the air on the Red Apple Podcast Network. Uh, I really don't have too much to say about last night. I, um, I just can't. I can't maintain the attention level required to look at anybody give a speech for more than 90 seconds. I just, I, it's, it's at a podium going on. Hello, everyone. And then the, the beginning, the middle and the end. We don't work like that anymore. Tell us what you got to tell us and then get the hell out. Ay, 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 and the fake applause lines and the feel good nonsense. It's not, it's not, it's not actually nonsense. It's a little bit dangerous. All this talk about joy. I'll get to it in a second. Oh, one highlight I'm looking at right now. Uh, Waltz's kid getting up there. Kind of goofy, right? I mean, I, I'm sorry. He's only 17. You can do a lot of things. I, I was goofy when I was 17. I would not have done that. Uh, let's see. My dad got promoted to, um, what was he promoted to when I was 17? Uh, I think he made inspector when I was in high school and I went to the big promotion ceremony and uh, they called him up on stage and Ben Ward made him an inspector. And we were all really, really thrilled. I sat down and I clapped to get up and point and say, that's my dad. And oh, by the way, it's not like this. His dad suddenly became a really important guy yesterday. I mean, he's been the governor of Minnesota for a long time. Doesn't mean much to me or you, but in Minnesota, that's kind of a big deal. Uh, let's see. Who do we have in New York? Who's the son or daughter of a governor here? Nobody comes to mind except the insufferable Chris Cuomo. Oh, my God. I I can't stand these stories. Like Chris Cuomo said something apparently yesterday that made sense. You know, for, the, for even Chris Cuomo is acknowledging that the Democrats... Yeah, I, I think. I'm, why do we celebrate it when some liberal pothead suddenly says something to, you know that makes sense? I think he was like, I don't know, decrying corporate influence, corporations buying influence, or something like that, which we kind of know about. Some of us have been, <laughs> have been raging about that for a long time. And uh, Chris Cuomo said something, and it's in the New York Post. Um, I just, <laughs> it's okay. It's good to know that Chris Cuomo's still out there somewhere. Um, whatever. Let's see. Let's see. You know about all this joy stuff and the emotion stuff. This is kind of serious. And one of my good friends, Sally, sent me this. And uh, I went through it. It's an academic paper, actually. And it's called The Mask of Joy, Emotional Manipulations in Political Campaigns. And it goes very, very in-depth. This whole idea of bringing joy back and everybody's joyous about Kamala Harris Generally speaking, we're not joyous as a community. Generally speaking, this is called collective happiness. And you know who pushed collective happiness or is pushing it besides the Democrats right now in this moment of illusion and confusion? Uh, Kim Jong Un, very much so. Uh, this is a thing that's big with the um, uh, communists everywhere. And communists are kind of dwindling, at least um, most of the backwards countries, you know, Vietnam, they figured it out, right? Didn't they figure it out? They figured it out. They got rid of communism, I think. Yeah, they did. Um, it doesn't work. Yet, it still has holds some appeal on college campuses and stuff like that. And with potheads like Bill de Blasio. Listen to this, please. Throughout history, political movements have frequently used the concept of joy as a tool to manipulate the masses. Joy, a powerful and positive emotion, has been co-opted by totalitarian regimes and political figures to obscure their true intentions, control, suppression of individual agency, and the erosion of freedom. This paper explores how the pursuit of joy through political campaigns has historically led to the loss of personal freedom and the rise of authoritarianism by governments and cultures that encourages emotional indulgence and suppresses critical thinking. There hasn't been an ounce of substance in any of this stuff they talked about. Just railing against Trump and the 24 felony convictions and the uh, he's a threat to national security, a threat to democracy. None of it. They can't talk about the border. They can't talk about Afghanistan. They can't talk about crime. They can't talk about this transgender mess without turning off America. Even liberal America. Oh, by the way, if they really wake up. 
The illusion of joy in political regimes. Political movements have made the promise of joy through their leaders. It often masks more sinister agendas. This facade of joy has been a hallmark of totalitarian regimes, uses a propaganda tool to conceal their oppressive policies. By promising collective happiness, an ideal often rooted in Eastern values, where the well-being of the collective is prioritized over individual rights, these regimes distract from the erosion of personal freedoms and the imposition of draconian controls. Draconian a term originating from the harsh legal codes of ancient Greece, refers to measures that are excessively severe or repressive. These controls are designed to maintain order and compliance at the expense of individual autonomy, often through fear, coercion, and the elimination of dissent. In totalitarian states, draconian measures are implemented under the guise of ensuring collective happiness. But in reality, they strip away the very freedoms that allow individuals to pursue their own happiness. Interventionism or the government's interference in various aspects of society plays a critical role in maintaining this illusion of joy. By intervening in the economy, culture and even personal lives, those regimes attempt to engineer a form of happiness that is uniform and state sanctioned. However, this kind of intervention often leads to the suppression of individual agency and freedom as the state imposes its version of happiness on the populace, leaving little room for personal choice or dissent. The promise of collective happiness thus becomes a tool for control where the state dictates the terms of joy and individual aspirations are sacrificed at the altar of their version of the supposed greater good. This approach while seemingly benevolent, is inherently oppressive as it prioritizes the needs of the state over the rights of the individual. Isn't this beautiful? I just love it that we have thinkers like this out there. Angela P. Vasquez, wherever the hell you are. I love it. I love it. Under Stalin's regime in Russia, joy was a manufactured emotion promoted to obscure the brutal realities of life under socialism. Propaganda posters proclaimed, we are warned by Stalin's affections. We are warmed, warmed by Stalin's affections. This message was designed to create a sense of collective happiness and loyalty to Stalin, while the regime systematically dismantled individual freedoms and agency. China, Mao and communist joy. Similarly, in Maoist China, joy was a tool of the state, Mao's words bring joy, declared propaganda, positioning the leader as the source of people's happiness. This emotional manipulation was a means to consolidate power, diverting attention from the widespread suffering and loss of personal autonomy under communist rule. Germany, Hitler, and fascist joy. In Nazi Germany, the concept of strength through joy was central to Hitler's propaganda machine. The regime promised joy through national unity and strength, while simultaneously stripping away individual rights and freedoms. This facade of joy, masked by the horrors of fascism and the regime's totalitarian control over every aspect of life. And now, America, the Harris Waltz campaign of joy. In more recent times, the concept of joy has surfaced in American politics. The campaign of joy, led by Kamala Harris, often nicknamed Kamila by critics, is an example of how modern political campaigns can use the promise of joy to garner support. However, this joy is often tied to policies that, upon closer inspection, threaten individual agency and freedom, much like the totalitarian regimes of the past. The illusion of joy and the dangers of emotional manipulation in political leadership as At a recent rally, Vice President Kamala Harris boasted about her tie-breaking vote on the Inflation Reduction Act, a piece of legislation that paid a role in driving inflation to a 40-year high. Now she's advocating for a federal ban on price gouging as part of her economic plan. But this plan is fundamentally flawed and insults the intelligence of the American people. In reality, profit margins in the grocery industry are typically well under 2% as a result of fierce competition in a market with abundant food supply. There is no food shortage in the United States, and the notion that monopolistic companies are price gouging is nothing more than a Jedi mind trick. Remember that? These are not the droids you're looking for. Uh, prices have not risen because of corporate greed, but because of reckless government spending. 
the government has expanded too much, doling out money to manipulate voters into supporting their platform. The concept of price gouging is misleading. It can only occur in situations where a single supplier dominates a market with no competition. And even then, the consumer must be willing to pay the set price. However, without an official definition, progressives use the term to criticize policies and prices they dislike. If Harris genuinely believes that price controls will reduce costs, she's ignoring historical evidence. Price controls have been tried before, and they have consistently led to disaster. When the government artificially lowers prices, demand increases while supply decreases because there is no longer any profit in producing the goods. This inevitability leads to shortages and bread lines. This anybody can understand, actually. This if you ever made it to college, and I'm talking freshman year college or even 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 like home economics in high school. Listen to this. Every economist understands that price controls are among the worst policies a government can implement. The government should not interfere with free markets. Harris's assumption that Americans are too ignorant to grasp the consequences of price controls is condescending. The notion that the federal government can simply legislate lower prices is a political move, not an economic one. And there's uh, many, many examples of price um, price controls that did not work from the Roman Empire to the French Revolution, Soviet Union, Nazi Germany, Argentina, under uh, under uh, Mr. Perón and his wife Evita, I guess. Juan Perón, was that his name? Zimbabwe. They tried price controls during hyperinflation from 2007 to 2008. During one of the worst hyperinflation crises in history, Zimbabwe's government imposed strict price controls, leading to widespread shortages and ex- ex- exacerbating the economic crisis, Venezuela, Cuba, on and on. Um, but it's joyous, right? Joyous. Going back to joy, joy, joy. It's an emotion. And emotions are powerful. I get that. They're powerful tools for manipulation, though. When politicians promise to deliver joy, they are engaging in emotional manipulation, creating a feeling that can cloud judgment and critical thinking. This tactic can lead people to support policies that ultimately undermine their own freedoms. As George Orwell depicted in 1984, the central character is indoctrinated into the cult of Big Brother, eventually finding joy in his submission to the regime. Similarly, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. I always hear about this guy. I've never read it. Part of the problem with Aldous Huxley, to be honest, you know when he died? Uh, The day the man man walked on the moon. (laughs) Just like it screwed up his legacy forever. Nobody noticed. They never wrote a decent obituary of him in the name still to this day. Like, who is this guy? Brave New World illustrates a society where happiness is artificially manufactured to keep the population complacent. These fictional examples serve as stark warnings of how joy can be weaponized by those in power to control the masses. Movements that seek joy via politicians are truly dangerous. This joy is nothing but a mask for control. It's mandatory fun, a joy that is required by those in power. As H.L. Mencken aptly put it, democracy is the theory that common people know what they want and deserve to get it good and hard. Easy there, (laughs) H.L. Okay. Uh, The pursuit of joy through political leadership often leads to ugly outcomes where control is exerted under the guise of happiness. All right. Wrapping up here. True joy does not come from politicians or their promises. It comes from your family, your community, your divine commitments, and your virtuous actions in the world. Real joy is rooted in personal meaning and purpose, not in the fleeting emotions generated by political rhetoric meant to manipulate or binging out on Netflix. Moreover, love, the deep connection between your well-being and that of others, is far more profound than the superficial joy offered by political movements. This love is what truly binds communities together together. And sustains freedom and individual agencies and goes on and on and on like this for pages and pages and pages. Uh, thank you, Angela P. Vasquez. Got to find out a little bit more about you. And Sally for passing this very insightful piece on to all of us. Be right back. Greg Kelly on the Red Apple Podcast Network. Greg Kelly, entertaining and informative on the Red Apple Podcast Network. I'm getting a couple of notes from my dear friends 
And uh, some pointing out that, well, Tim Waltz's son has a, a disability. While I respect these people very much who are reaching out to me, I don't believe one damn thing about Tim Waltz anymore or any of these people. You know, Joe Biden, they told us, had a stutter, right? You know when we found out that he had a stutter? Uh, after he ran for president in 1987 and got kicked out for lying and plagiarizing. And it was a bid to gain garner sympathy. Man had been a United States senator for like 15 years at that point. No word of a stutter. No word. You can't find one single documentation of him having a stutter at any point except a political editorial in the Washington Post written in 1987, October 1987. They always do that. A bid for sympathy. This guy, Waltz, you know, I would not have gotten to this place myself. But after talking to people like Gordon Chang, uh, General Blaine Holt, uh, others, I mean, there's like a 50-50 chance that this guy is some sort of Manchurian candidate. There is a there is a damn good chance that this guy is controlled by China. Damn good chance. Uh, the fascination with China at a time when the government was repressive, murdering its own people. I mean, it's always done that, doing it right now. But in horrific and public, spectacular fashion, the Tiananmen Square massacre. This guy is over there and then decides, opts to get married on Tiananmen Square Day. Tiananmen Square, the day they killed the people? That's not a good day. That's a bad day. Uh, 30 times over the years, he did business with communist China, not as a lobbyist, not as a, not as a, sen- uh, a governor or whatever, but as a social studies teacher. You know, the intelligence community, they do groom people very, very early on. Some of the worst scandals, some of the worst uh, compromises, losses of classified data. It, you know who doesn't do the leaking? Generals and admirals, generally speaking, don't do it. They get lower, lower ranked people enlisted like or a brand new lieutenant JG, people who just joined the military, people who are just joining companies like IBM and the rest. And you get them early and you groom them. You groom them so ultimately one day they may be important. And then you've got a Manchurian candidate. You ever seen the movie Manchurian Candidate? Look, this guy is totally weird. His policies are insane. And this mass hysteria, this propaganda we're in the midst of, nothing is off the table. Nothing at all. This big Tunnel to Towers Foundation walk run is coming on Sunday, September 29th. And all of us here at Red Apple Audio Networks are encouraging you folks to donate to our individual teams. All right. The website is walk.gregkellyshow.com. Walk.gregkellyshow.com. Now, I don't get the money. Tunnel to Towers gets the money. But we want to raise as much as we can, okay? Uh, for the veterans, uh, for first responders, those affected by 9-11 to this day, please, Tunnel to Towers, they're great. Go to walk.gregkellyshow.com. Many thanks. Greg Kelly on the Red Apple Podcast Network. Greg Kelly, entertaining and informative on the Red Apple Podcast Network. I love people. I love I love the people. <laughs> so, all right, the speeches were silly and long and boring and uh lacked substance. And so, why not make fun of some stuff? And this guy, he puts something on 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 Instagram, I guess TikTok as well. Nancy Pelosi's coming out and she, the headline is what fell out of Nancy Pelosi's pants? Like, what does this mean? And you watch her, you watch her, and something unmistakably comes out of her pants. We don't know what it is, what it could be, but she dropped something. Did she pick it up? What was it? What was it? She is, um, well, she's a very powerful woman. A very powerful woman indeed. 14 million people voted for Joe Biden. And we got everybody pretending like this is normal, that this is okay, Nancy Pelosi, Barack Obama, Hakeem Jeffries, Chuck Schumer, probably a billionaire or two, and maybe a prosecutor said, you're done, Joe. we got a couple of options for you here. 25th Amendment, how does that sound? How does indictment sound? 
how does uh, we throw about, mm, I don't know, 75 more charges at at Hunter? Because you know we're being nice to him, okay? We're being nice to him because of a professional uh, a professional courtesy to you, and we hate Trump, all right? This could get really ugly really fast. So what are you going to do, Joe? I mean, how do you get a guy to go from, I'm not getting out of the race, to, I endorse Kamala Harris, a person he hates, he absolutely despises. Kamala Harris, notice that she's, sometimes she's there, sometimes she's not in the hall. She's not there. Uh, she wasn't there the other night because, well, I think that was one of the stipulations in the agreement for Joe Biden to leave. Joe Biden has been totally and completely humiliated by the Obamas. The Obamas. Did you see them the other day with their clothes? I like to look good in a suit. Donald Trump looks great in a suit. That's a very nice suit. I don't think I've ever seen that kind of fabric in my life. Maybe, maybe, no. I was going to say I once noticed Prince Charles wearing something that was like that. No. This was, this was the finest, this was, you can't get this stuff. All right? This was, I think it was $100,000. That was $100,000 worth of clothes. And the man has the sheen of somebody who's meticulously, all he has to do is, well, look after his funds. Well, actually, he could be kind of busy running the country, right? Why him? What's so special about him? People got really upset when I said um, Michelle Obama didn't have a job. Again, ask yourself, ask somebody else, what was her job before First Lady? And nobody knows. Nobody. You can ask a thousand people, blank dead stares. What did she do to get a hundred million dollar deal from Netflix? Why did, why was that book becoming Michelle when she married a guy that, oh, by the way, she almost divorced. Okay. They kind of came to some sort of an agreement at some point. Um, that much I do, I do know that part. I do. Even Barack went there in his book a little bit. The audacity. The audacity of dreams, the dreams of uh, my stepfather, uh, the uh, coming, the coming rising sun. He's got seventeen books about himself. Hello, Jeff. What is it, Greg? You, Greg, thank you. You hit the, uh, two things yesterday. You said father in the home, and then you said your hometown. Uh, sorry, you said uh, your hometown, Baldwin and what, Garden City. Yes. Are you on the oh, Long Island yeah. Sound right now? The it's windy. Can you? Can you? I don't know. Lower your. Go, can you ha- go behind a wall or something, or go below deck? I did. I went below deck. There. Was, all right. No, so, something's yeah, blowing. Is. It's bothering me. Where are you? I'm moving. Oh, I'm good. Moving. It's better. Actually, it's better. I, Thank I, you. I, What's up? I've got like three hundred dollar headphones on. Okay, so here's the deal. Like, and then you said that you went on the phone with your dad, and I was like touched because I was thinking, man, Bald. And you mentioned Baldwin, and you mentioned Garden City, and. A lot of things you say, Uh-oh. I would think about calling you about a topic and you'll say it. And I'm not trying to be weird, Greg, but yeah. And like, there's a lot of things that uh, you hit home about. You're genuine. Well, You're very genuine. Oh, very nice. And, Thank uh, you. Were you going to call about Baldwin or something? What 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 what, uh, tr- what 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 got your attention about Baldwin and Garden City? Well, no, what got me attention was you spoke with your dad because I because my dad had friends that were cops and. My dad had all kinds of cool friends that came by, and we went by, and you know, I could I could see like you one of the friends that my dad knew, and I went by their house and played. Like I I was I was reflecting on stuff like that, you know. I don't know you from Adam, but I bet your dad took you to that diner right near the first precinct. Uh, and what was that? Yeah, on Merrick Road. You ever go to that little diner? That little little hole in the wall? <sighs> you know, as a kid. I don't remember Merrick Road all that. You know what I mean? We went everywhere. We went to, we went, we went to, the diners I remember are the one on, um, there's one on Jericho Turnpike right behind Fortunoff. We went there a lot, uh, which I think is still there. Um, you know what he would get at the diner? Liver. We would go to the diner so he could get liver. And, uh, I tried to be a big man and eat the liver too. I don't like it. He likes it. But yeah, you know, Nunley's and the rest and all that stuff. And what was the name of that st- place? Bigelow's, the, the clam, the clam bake stuff. And what else? Back then, Arthur Treacher's was like a really big treat. Um, how old are you? I'm 56 and I got to work for the police department as a civilian. So I got to see all of Nassau County on their time. When I tell you the fourth precinct is right near Queens by JFK. 
watched. Uh, I used to watch the. Uh, remember that the, the Concord used to come in around nine fourteen or something like that. Used to land every day. We'd come back to Concord when it was still in service. Yeah, we were really excited. I got a glimpse of it a couple of times as a kid. It went over Garden City, not often, but sometimes. We would go. My dad would bring us to the uh, Pan Am terminal. We'd go to the roof and watch planes land and take off. Hey, one thing I'll say, you know, reminding me, you say friends, friends of your dad. I do remember and uh, having my dad having parties for his colleagues, you know, and, um, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe once a year, twice a year, you know, and they were great guys from all over the place. I remember it very, very well. And, um, you know, oh, by the way, <laughs> because now it's become such a sticking point. It wasn't back then. Color, race, it wasn't a big deal. It just wasn't. I know it was kind of a hot topic in some sense, but in people's daily lives, it wasn't. My dad brought me, I think the first time he brought me to work, for whatever reason, it was the highway patrol. I think he was special operations. And the thing I remember most is getting a ride from this guy, a cop, on a, on a police motorcycle. It was the coolest thing in the world. The guy happened to be black. It's like, I don't know. We had so much diversity that we didn't really think about it. It wasn't a thing. And it was natural. And it now it's, I don't know, everyone's so uptight about it. I don't get it. I don't get it. It was, I hate to be like, you know, Mr. Yesteryear and that kind of thing, but it was better. It wasn't many. Now, then again, I mean, my God, in 1973, something like 15 cops were shot in one year. I mean, we had problems. We had problems. But in many respects, and I'm talking about daily lives of people, race relations, people weren't as uptight. I know that there were certain things. Hell, you heard the N-word on TV. But now it's, oh, hey, did you, anyway. Hey, thanks, man. Uh, so where are you right now? And I got to go. I'm in Queens. I'm in Queens. Well, thank, and, uh, yeah. Th- thanks for yeah. checking in. Stay in touch. Uh yeah, uh, it's all in my, it's all in my book, by the way. Um, I actually go on about that. There was a time, well, let me put it to you this way. If you say you have black friends, if you happen to be white or Asian and you say you have black friends or you're Hispanic and you say you have black friends, that today cleverly in a weird way, not so clever, just rather obnoxiously by the left, that's somehow proof of racism. If you say, well, I happen to ha- I have black friends. That is proof that you're a racist. How can that be? How can, like, right? It's, it's kind of obvious that that would reveal a lack of racism. So they take the, 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 the a major component where you're not racist. We're not right. Ra- we're, and they, they, they take that off the table. Now, because it's taken off the table, and I, I've been asked this before, once in a public format. You probably don't have any black friends. And I said, you know, because you asked that question in that nasty way, I'm not going to tell you whether I do or not. And I don't want any of my friends, whatever they look like, whoever they are, wherever they're coming from, thinking that for one reason or another, whatever they look like, whether they're all light, all black, all Chinese, that I have some sort of ancillary motive for having them as a friend. Like that someday I could say, I have a black friend. Anyway, it's just so stupid. The American culture having a ludicrous conversation about race to avoid the important conversation about race. And oh, by the way, you know, it just blew up. So in the aftermath of George Floyd, everybody wanted to show how virtuous they were, right? Every industry, whether whether you were Frito-Lay, 7-Eleven, um, Exxon, or the book publishing industry, the thing you did right away, and I'll take Exxon out. And 7-Eleven out, because I don't know this if that's true. But, for example, book publishing. They went bananas. They hired b- black people all over the place. They just, like, but it didn't matter. They weren't looking for qualifications. They were looking for black people. It didn't matter if you had never been in book publishing. Just, we need some black faces around here. They did such an injustice to the to the people behind those faces, they took people who, guess what, weren't ready for the job, weren't qualified, but in the rush to be virtuous, in the rush to be, look at us, we're not racist, you have hurt a lot of good people, like perhaps people who weren't black, who were qualified for those jobs, or the other black people who might have been harder to find and were qualified. Instead, you went to the nearest black face you could find 
and made arrangements. And guess what's happening now? They're all getting fired. They're all getting fired. It's all crashing and burning with very little attention, very little scrutiny, but it's all blown up. Now, they're keeping it under wraps. It's blown up, but the, the, the explosion is kind of concealed, kind of covered, because uh, it's embarrassing to a lot of people. I don't like the New York Times, but they did a big story on this, all the black executives being let go because a lot of the people they fired knee-jerk or weren't ready for the job. It's funny. They don't actually mention why any of them were let go. They imply because they're black. No, it's because you cut corners in hiring these particular black people. It's not what we're about. It's not who we are. Yet here we are. If Kamala Harris wins this election, if she wins, and right now it's 50-50, it's 50-50. Can you believe that? This hideously unqualified person. And what's going to happen four years later? Maybe then they'll find out. It'll be too late. I mean, we're flirting with World War III. And Joy, another thing about the Joy, it's to cover up her inappropriate giggling, probably alcohol or drug and or drug-inspired frivolity. That's another reason why they're pushing this Joy stuff. One, it's uh, it's got communist roots. Two, every time Kamala Harris is giggling, they can say, oh, she's not high, she's joyous. You see? I'm not kidding. It's true. This is happening. I'll be right back. Greg Kelly on the Red Apple Podcast Network. Greg Kelly, entertaining and informative on the Red Apple Podcast Network. London Roberts, we got to get her on the show. She's making the rounds. Who's London Roberts? Uh, The woman who was uh, briefly involved with Hunter Biden had his baby, and Hunter turned his back on her, his responsibility. She had the child. He denied it. He went to court to fight it. A judge had to force him to take a paternity test. That baby, that beautiful baby, Navy is the baby's name, is Hunter Biden's child. That makes that baby the grandchild of President Joe Biden. What did Joe do along with Hunter? They turned their back on their responsibility, the decency, right? They just said no. And they fought it every step of the way. And even when Hunter was forced to finally pay uh, paternity and support, he would continually petition the judge to lower those payments. He just wouldn't do the right thing and insisted that legally this child could not refer to uh, herself or be referred to as a Biden, B-I-D-E-N. I remember Joe was going around, my six grandchildren, I have six grandchildren. I have six of them. I love them. No, every step of the way, every time he said that, he had seven, and he knew it. And he knew it. Not a decent man. This really is just another reflection of the bizarro, backward, mirror, mirror, upside down, parallel universe we're living in right now. Joe Biden is Mr. Empathy, Mr. Decency. He would not acknowledge the grandchild. I mean, I know most, I think most grandparents, if they found, most people... Joe Biden's age, if they already had some grant, they found out about another one. They, you couldn't hold them back. There'd be a stampede. Let's see the baby. Let's see that baby. I don't care where the baby is. You find Arkansas. That's where the baby. Yeah. Arkansas. Man, these people are low lives. You know how, why Joe finally recognized Navy? Because the New York Times wrote a nasty op ed saying, Joe, we know you're better than this. I guess it was not that nasty, but it was like, we know you're better than this. Joe, you're a good and honorable man. Please do the good and honorable thing. He had to be shamed into doing it. And now that the baby has been acknowledged, like they put out a press release asking for privacy. And yes, that grandchild, we want the very best for that grandchild. They haven't even seen the baby. They didn't bother to see it. You're the president of the United States. You can fly there in Air Force One. Had the baby flown up on Air Force One. If you can't do that, jet blue, something. Get that baby in your arms. I'm all, I would not. Look, look, I'm not proud of it, but I was a, you know, I was a bit of a dog for a long time. You know what I mean? Promiscuous. Is that the word? I don't like that word, promiscuous. I was a bit of a player. 
I was. If I found out today that I had a child out there, which is, I mean, I'm just gonna, it's, it's not the case. It's not the case. I mean, there is like a one in a million chance that there is. I don't think so. But I, ha- I would have to drop everything immediately and, do, and and find out and see this child and do everything I could. It wouldn't be nice when I came home to the wife, but I'd have to, you know, I you just step up. There's some things you just do the right thing no matter what. And that they put this very, this woman. Now, granted, this London Roberts, I have my beef with her, too. You know how she first meets uh, Hunter at a party at his office? That sounds legit. Hey, let's have a party at my office. And people are drinking in one room and having a good time. And uh, they find out Hunter is there. And say that she and her girlfriend go looking for Hunter. And where do they find him? They find him in another office by himself, arranging his drug paraphernalia. I don't know what they do. You know, they take the card and they cut up the cocaine or they put the cocaine in the line or maybe it was the heroin or whatever. And she's like... He had such piercing eyes, and he seemed lonely and confused, but also endearing and intelligent. Like, he's a drug addict. You saw this the very first time you saw him, and you said, I want to get closer to that. London, what's wrong with you? I know, I know, I know people out there said she's a very nice woman, and whatever. She made some big mistakes falling for that guy. Obviously, Elliot, hello. Hey, thank you, Greg. Hi. So... You know, oh, it reminded me was uh, Gavin Newsom when he went to the laundry during COVID. And it came to my mind that these publishing houses for books and Netflix, they really are laundromats for laundering money. What they're doing is they're taking all these investors, you know, their money, raising $60, $70 million for a book. And meanwhile, they sell 10 copies. This is unbelievable what goes on with the publishing houses. Some of the publishing houses are decent. Look, I have a book. I'm a little conflicted here. I mean, no, I'm not conflicted. Simon & Schuster. I had a book deal with Simon & Schuster. We weren't laundering money, all right? I worked my ass off to get that book sold, and we sold. We did all right. But I know what you mean. There are sometimes you get a book deal where the the number is obscene, and nobody has that. Like, did you know Netflix, There's a, or maybe it's Amazon, there's a documentary, a movie about Pete Buttigieg. There's a movie about Pete Buttigieg, starring Pete Buttigieg. Why, why would, why, why, right? It's, it's fishy. It's fishy. You pay these people a lot of money and they'll do something. They own you actually going forward. Uh, of course, there's the gay fascination with Pete Buttigieg. Um, political reporters are just, they can't, they can't get enough. I think a lot of them want to date him. I mean, fine, but you don't have to. You don't have to compromise your work. Great point, Elliot. Great point. Let me go to Matt real quick. Hi. Say, Matt. Uh, uh, Greg, sorry about that. You're Matt. What's up? Uh, I thought I thought of something about uh, Trump could do at his rallies, and I would like your opinion on it. I think what he should do at these rallies, he has these big screens inside and out, and then he tells everyone, "I'm running against an invisible candidate, and tonight we're going to make a visible." And then on the screen, he shows her on the screen talking about, say, the border, everything she said about the border. Then it cuts off. Donald Trump goes to what he did with the border, how he did it, what he's going to do. All right. Sounds like, you know, you should probably get yourself on the campaign and, you know, pitch that. You know, they're already playing all kinds of, you know, interesting features with the big screen, though, right? They already they're doing a lot of that. Good stuff, pal.